Hey guys, I'm Drew. I'm Vera. And we are HPC Global Online Pastors. We're so glad that you joined us for today's message. We hope that it encourages you, builds your faith, and just makes your life better. Now watch this message, and we'll be right back. The Lord started putting this in my heart about three weeks ago, to be honest with you. And it's one reason why I But I want you to understand that there are a lot of principalities and there's a lot of kingdoms in the unseen. Today, I want to talk about being a citizen of the kingdom of God. In our daily lives, when asked to identify ourselves, we often refer to our nationality as a primary marker of our identity. As inhabitants of this earthly realm, we proudly proclaim our citizenship in the country in which we reside. For instance, for those living in the United States of America, stating, I am a citizen of the United States, is a common and proud declaration. However, beyond the physical realm lies a deeper truth that transcends borders and earthly kingdoms. As spiritual beings dwelling in mortal bodies and possessing souls, our identity extends beyond the confines of nationality or earthly citizenship. Are you with me? For Christians, the realization prompts a profound shift in perspective, one that acknowledges a higher allegiance and a divine citizenship over these realms of darkness. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, says for our struggle, and I did not give you this scripture, I added it after I gave you my notes, so you can just look it up or, or follow, the rest will be on screen, but Ephesians 6, 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in evil, of evil in heavenly realms. In recognizing the spiritual warfare that surrounds us, Christians are called to affirm their true identity as Christians and citizens of the kingdom of God. See, I'm gonna take a second and tell you today the reason that Satan has rule over this air and over this earthly realm is because God gave Adam, the first man, authority and rule over everything. Have you thought about this? Someone said this this week and made me think. He created Adam on the sixth day and he gave him authority to name everything. So on the first five days, everything that was created was wandering around with no aim or identity until God created man and gave us his authority. Sin separated us from God and therefore brought in the authority of the ruler of this, of, of, gave Satan the authority to rule over them to speak the right words and stop saying things like my head is killing me. Do you want to die because you have a headache? Stop saying that your head is killing you because Proverbs 18, 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue. God stepped into nothing is what we say sometimes and he spoke everything into existence. In fact, what he did, he stepped into and on the power of his own deity and spoke life and life came. 
Then he gave man the ability to speak life and name everything. And remember the first five days, nothing had a name. So the, the lion didn't understand or know if he was supposed to be in uh, at odds with the, the lamb, the, the, the tree, the cedar tree didn't know what he was supposed to do. The, 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 all the other animals, they were just roaming. I don't have any other explanation or reason for that until they had a name and a purpose and that name and purpose was only given to them by the man that God created and gave that authority to. But when we gave up that authority by not following God's heart, because God's heart was for us to live free, God's heart was for us to not, not to um, have pain in childbirth. God's heart was not for us to have storms. I've preached this for a long time and someone reminded me of it this week, so I'm gonna tell you again. We blame God for things God has nothing to do with. And the reason I say that is we have this tendency to say, well, God is in control. I'm gonna... I'm going to mess that theology up today. God is not in control of everything. If God was in control of everything, there would be no rapes. There would be no murders. I tell you what we do. We say, well, God's in control when we don't know what to say. It's my birthday, so smile at me whether you agree or not. I want you to be free. And the reason I'm telling you this today is I want you to understand that there's powers and principalities in places that we do not see, but also there is a King of kings and the Lord of lords that is operating in what you do not see. And we have the power to bring what you do not see. See, the reason we must understand that our words, you can't see my words. You can only see the result of my words. But when you speak what God has said, you are aligning your words with the very word and the breath of God and you will begin to see in your life what God says that you are and you can have. See, the Bible says when you give, it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now, when I put my actions and my faith according to his word, then I see the manifestation of what he says I can have. I'm gonna get back to my notes. But it is my birthday, so keep smiling. Authority and responsibility to advance authority and responsibility to advance his kingdom on the earth through prayer, through worship, through acts of love, through acts of kindness and sharing the message of redemption. When we make the decision to do this, we in fact become ambassadors of the heavenly realm, bringing light into darkness and hope into hopelessness. How many know that this world needs hope today? Everybody's looking for a Democrat or a Republican. I'm gonna tell you, I don't believe Jesus is either Democrat or Republican. I believe that he is people. He is people. And if you're today and you're here, uh, you are a Democrat or you're a Republican, I'm telling you, seek the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As a U.S. citizen, vote for who you want to. But as a citizen of the kingdom of God, seek first him. Seek him first. Look first to his word. Look to the economics of the Bible before you look at the economics of the country. Look at the ethics of the word before you look at the ethics of a party. I'm here to decree and declare today that if it symbolizes our commitment to living out the values of the kingdom in a world that's bombarded with division and strife and spiritual warfare, identifying ourselves as citizens of the kingdom of God serves as a powerful declaration of our faith and trust in the Almighty. The kingdom values are love. I said the kingdom values are love, justice, mercy, and righteousness in a world that often seems devoid of these virtues. So as we navigate the complexities of life on earth, let us remember our dual citizenship. 
Ooh, there's a lot of people today that are walking around with dual citizenship. Maybe they have a citizenship in another country and they have one here. I'm here to declare to you today I have dual citizenship. In my flesh, I am an, uh, uh, an American. I am a citizen of the United States of America. But as a child of the Most High God, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. We are citizens of our earthly nations and we are citizens of our kingdom nation. By embracing your spiritual citizenship and aligning yourself with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you will be tapping into a wellspring of strength, of courage, divine authority that empowers you to overcome every obstacle and challenge that might come your way. And may we as citizens of the kingdom kingdom of God shine brightly in a world shrouded with darkness embodying the love and grace of our heavenly father in all that we say and in all that we do can somebody join me today and say I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God come on say it to somebody else I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God I wanna talk about four things today about being a citizen. First, I wanna talk about our identity as citizens of the kingdom. Philippians 3.20. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven and from there we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, as followers of Christ, our citizenship, our true citizenship is in the kingdom of God. This world is not our final home. Somebody say praise the Lord for that. The world is not our final home. We are called to live as ambassadors of Christ, representing the kingdom, his kingdom, his kingdom values of love, of justice, of righteousness in all that we do. See, on July 21st, 1969, I became a citizen of the United States of America. 55 years ago today, I was born into my citizenship. I was born into the rights that I have as a citizen of America. But this citizenship and its benefits end on the day of my death, my physical death. But I'm here to decree and declare that on January, in January of 1975, I became a citizen of the kingdom of God. I was born again <laughs> into the kingdom citizenship. I was born into the rights that I have as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I've got better news for you than that. Those rights transcend the boundaries of all my human existence. Those rights are with me from the day of conception until the day of the rest of eternity because my I am a spirit. I live in a body and I possess a soul. I am not dying, but I am transitioning one day. Once I get to the age that, that I move from this life to the next, my hope is not not in this, this place alone, but I have hope in Jesus Christ and I know that my power and my authority is not based on my age, it's not based on my race, it's not based on my ethnicity, but it's based on the fact that I have called him the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And for the rest of my life, all through eternity, I am gonna be who I am in Christ. Somebody say, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I want to talk about embracing kingdom values. Matthew 6, says, but seek, I'm sorry, but first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after the kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. The attitude and character of God. And all these things will be given to you also. I am thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. I love to embrace all the privileges that come with being a citizen of the United States of America. I love that, I love the fact that 
we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I am honored to stand, remove my cap, hold my hand over my heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I'm thankful for baseball, apple pie, and hot rods. I don't know what your American dream is, but it's kind of like that for me. Hot rods might be before baseball for me, but I just thought I would go that way. But as a king, but as a citizen of the kingdom of God, I prioritize seeking God's kingdom above all else. That is walking in kingdom values. We're called as citizens of the kingdom of God to embody the values of the kingdom. And the first thing that Jesus said, the most important thing that Jesus said was to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your your being, basically. But I want to point your attention to the fact that he also said, just like that, just like you love God, as much as you love God, he said, just like that. See, it's easy for us to love a God that is not seen. Because in a fleshly way, there's no accountability to that. See, we live in a world that teaches us to go on what you see. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Well, I'll see it when I believe it. Or I love this one, sarcastically said as the pastor spoke. I just call it like I see it. I got news for it. If you don't want to keep seeing what you see, stop calling what you see because you're bringing life and prolonging what you see. See, faith and denial are not the same thing. Faith is not denying that there's pain in your body, but faith is declaring that God's word said you are healed even while you're dealing with the pain. And if you don't declare that, you'll never see that. Because Satan's biggest tool against you is fear. Oh, my 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 folks all died of complications from sugar diabetes. Do I do you know what I'm gonna say to you today? I believe that you can stop generational curses in your life. Now, pastor, there's no cure to sugar diabetes. Tell my sister that. Someone that that medicated herself for over 50 years as a type one diabetic. She's got the paperwork, baby, to show you. This is not some preacher story that I'm just pulling out of the air, but for over 50 years, a, a, a certified type one diabetic. Now, did she drastically change her diet? I'm talking drastically, yes. Did she do everything she physically could that she knew was right? Yes, she did. But see, the reason that the Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith, first of all, he calls it a good fight because you can win it. Ain't no good fight that you ever lost. Anybody ever fought a fight and lost it and thought, boy, that's a good fight? No, you got your head knocked in. That wasn't good. But a good fight of faith means that you have the power through your faith to overcome the enemy and come out on top because you are standing on the word of God. And what she did was she she dared to believe that even though she'd been told over 50 years that there's no cure for this. See, the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, everything will bow, everything that has a name. And so if it's been called over your life, why don't you just call the blood of Jesus to wash away that declaration of man and start declaring the things 
of the Lord. See, my mama in 1982, she, she had cancer, but today she is 89 years old, I think, and she is still, I talked to her yesterday. She called me and wished me happy birthday. She sent me $50 this week. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I love President Grant. Hallelujah. But today, she's still with me. And you know what I did when I was 17 years old and my dad passed away from a, a, a family disease. All of his biological siblings have all died and they died early because of the same thing except for one. One died of TB. The rest of them died from hypertension and things that associated stroke, heart attack, high blood pressure. But what I did at 17, and I did not understand declaring and decreeing. I did not understand Proverbs 18, 21 like I understand it today. And I wasn't even saying it from a spiritual standpoint. But I got news for you. Your words are spiritual because they operate in an unseen place. Whether you mean what you say or you don't mean what you say, you better know what you say will be held accountable in the realm of where you are. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And at 17 years old, I told my mama, I started running. And I told my mama, I said, I ain't never going to get out of a 32 pant. I, I wore jeans. I said, I ain't never going to buy nothing but 32s. I told a fib, because now I wear 31s. <laughs> I think it was only because back then you wore everything baggy now, you know, <laughs> but... But I said, I'm not going <laughs> to, I miss my daddy really bad still after 30 some years. And I said, I'm not going to leave my kids early. And you know what? Today at 436, my wife said, because I told her I was going to get up at four and she leaned over and she said, it's 436 if you're getting up. I said, okay. Thank you, Jesus, for this helpmate. <laughs> But you know what, I got up and I went, not because anybody else here even cares, but I made a declaration that I'm gonna do what I can and I'm gonna eat right and I'm gonna take care of my body because I wanna be here for my grandbabies. God knows I want grandbabies. But, <laughs> but I got up this morning and I'm thankful today that I was able to do my five and a half miles, I was able to get home and get on a scale and be thankful for my weight. What are you talking about all this stuff for? I'm telling you, you have the power inside of you as an authoritarian of the kingdom of God to control what goes on in the earth around and in you. I believe when Jesus said, pray like this, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, in earth, we say on earth, but if you look in your King James Bible, it says in earth. Do you remember what Adam was made out of? He was formed out of the earth. And I believe that when his kingdom is set alive inside of you, it is set alive inside the kingdom of God. I believe right now that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth, in earth, whichever way you wanna say it, as it is in heaven and I believe God is an eternal God and I'm an eternal being I live in a body but I'm an eternal being you're an eternal being that's gonna be somewhere in eternity and when we call him the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings we can call those things that are not in the physical that they will be in the physical because we can call those things that are not as though they were and the word teaches us that they will be there not according to anything, but according to his word. We're called as citizens of the kingdom of God to embody the values of the kingdom. Love, mercy, forgiveness, humility in our interactions with others in the way that we live our lives. Somebody say, I'm a, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I wanna talk about advancing the kingdom through service. Matthew 20, 28. By the way, we got two more birthdays in the house today, y'all. Tiffany, where you at? Stand, stand up, Tiffany. Today her, is her birthday, y'all. Give her a big hand. You may be seated. Helen, my Sam's Club friend, stand up. Their birthday is the same as mine and Robin Williams and Barney Five. 
Is Candy's birthday today? Well, Candy, stand up. I didn't even know that. Stand up. That's awesome. Happy birthday. Advancing the kingdom through service. Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many paying the price to set, free, set them free from the penalty of sin. Following the example of Jesus, we're called to be servants and in and of the kingdom of God by serving others with love, by serving others with humility. We advance God's kingdom on the earth and bring glory. I'm gonna be preaching about glory next week if God doesn't change my direction. I believe it is, it is time for the church to look for the glory of the Lord and to expect the glory of the Lord, to understand that it is our right to walk in the glory of the Lord. I ain't preaching it today. I'm preaching it next week. By serving others with love and humility, we advance the kingdom on earth and bring glory to his name. It's been said about God's glory, and I quote, I looked this up yesterday, and I quote from an essay written by a man, and I don't know this man, but his name is Christopher Morgan, and I found it on the gospelcoalition.org website. And I wanna read this because I thought it to be pertinent of what I'm talking about today. The glory of God is... The magnificence, the magnificent worth, loveliness, and grandeur of many perfections, which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. The glory of God is interwoven throughout the biblical story and forms the origin, content, and goal of the entire cosmic narrative. God's glory is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of his many perfections. God communicates his glory through his creation, image bearers, providence, and redemptive acts. God's people respond by glorifying him. God receives glory and through united his people to Christ shares his glory with them. And all of, his, all of this contributes to his glory as God in his manifold perfections is exhibited, known, and rejoiced in, and prized. See, advancing the kingdom of God takes the willingness of the people that identify as citizens of the kingdom of God. Today, America is great because of the service men and women that have sacrificed some of their very lives. They gave service. Today, our judicial system and our political system, as broken as it may seem, is successful in the way that it was designed because of people being willing to give their selves and give service to their country. But today I'm so grateful and thankful to declare and decree that may we the people and may we be a people of the kingdom of God that seek opportunities to serve those in need Share the good news of the kingdom with all to come to the knowledge of the kingdom of God so that they too can share in his glory. Somebody say, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. The last thing I wanna talk about today is unity in the kingdom. You know what the United States is lacking today? is unity. And I'm gonna proclaim it no matter how many people tell me I ought to be telling people who to vote for. I ain't gonna tell you who to vote for. I'm gonna tell you go to Jesus and then go to the poll and exercise your right as a, as a U.S. citizen however you decide. I 
person. They like it back in the day when somebody say, who you voting for? And they say, ain't none of your business. That's between me and God. Now you can be however you want to and exuberant as you want to and I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you today we're lacking unity in the United States of America. And I believe according to Ephesians 4, 3, it says make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace, each individual, each individual working together to make the whole successful. You know what, this morning, I'm just gonna tell you, one of my biggest blessings, I was blessed when I came back from running and my wife had left me a card. I was so blessed when I walk into my office and my children had decorated and they got balloons everywhere and they got my favorite snacks and even got an opera lamp poster from back in the day for me as a gift. I'm blessed by all that, but one of the biggest blessings that I received this morning was from a pastor from another core set of beliefs. I know that he and I have probably doctrinal differences. Someone that I don't even know other than knowing that I'm associated with him on Facebook. I have never had more than a, hey, how you doing, kind of conversation with this man. But you know what he did? He sent me a message through Facebook today and I mean, I just started crying. It wasn't a long message. And maybe for others, you wouldn't have cried. I cry. But he just said, brother, I speak blessings over your life and over your family. I speak blessings over your church and I speak blessings on your birthday. And I thought, man, that is the unity of the kingdom right there. He and I may preach different doctrines today, but we're still in the same kingdom. Y'all didn't even hear that. I said, we may have a few differences of what we believe on certain things, but we're still in agreement that there's one king and his name is Jesus, that there's one God and he created it all. There's one spirit and he's inside the believer. I'm here today to tell you that if we will seek for unity in the kingdom as members of the kingdom church, and we've heard that so much, but I want you to know that there's only one kingdom church. There's not a Baptist kingdom and a Presbyterian kingdom and a Church of God kingdom and a UPC kingdom. No, 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 no. I'm here to tell you there's one kingdom and it's the kingdom of God. As members of the kingdom church and citizen of the kingdom of God, we are called to maintain beautiful unity among believers. Despite our differences, we are united in our faith in Christ and our mission to spread the gospel. Now, I am going to tell you something. That we're real good in the church to preach about the gospel of Jesus. We're pretty good at that. But why don't we preach what Jesus preached? We preach about Jesus a lot, and that's good. I'm not against that. But Jesus didn't just preach about himself. He preached about the kingdom. He preached about the Father. He preached, he said when, when he was in so many different situations, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Today, I believe if we would preach the values of Jesus instead of just preaching Jesus. I got one come on and no amens. I'm gonna say that again. I believe if we would preach the values that Jesus preached and not just preach about Jesus. I love talking about Jesus. Do not get me wrong. And without Jesus, we have no remission of our sins because he paid the price on Calvary's tree. But he said... Every time that the devil came toward him, he said, it is written. It is written. I'm ready for us to walk in kingdom values and to promote unity by living by what the word says. 
Not what your doctrinal statement. Man, I was raised in a church that it was wrong to go swimming with the opposite sex other than the immediate family. It was wrong to be to wear jewelry as an adornment other than your wedding ring. It was wrong to do the I'm I'm just quoting. And I remember as a 10-year-old boy sitting on the piano at Farrellsburg, West Virginia, loving my church and still to this day very thankful for my heritage, wondering what we did believe in because I knew what we didn't believe in. Let us work to love one another. And until you get that, don't try to whoop devils. Don't try to cast out demons if you don't love your neighbor. Don't. It ain't gonna work. Love is not acceptance of the ways that are different from what God's kingdom is. Love is compassion, forgiveness. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and live by that. Let's work to forgive freely and quickly. <laughs> Let's intentionally do what it takes to work together in harmony to fulfill God's purposes for his kingdom. <laughs> you can ask my wife, I sat on the porch yesterday for four hours, three hours, something like that. I just sat there and I cried and I wrote and I cried and I got to this part when he told me what to do in the service and I cried a lot it was April 18th 1989 I met LaDonna Glimmer Clemmer, LaDonna Glee Clemmer She and I fell completely head over heels in love. And we spent every day and every night together. Not too long after that. On July the 29th, coming up next week, would have been our 35th wedding anniversary. I honor LaDonna to this day in our home in our family and in this church on June 4th 2016 at 1250 p.m. was the hardest moment of my life as we were gathered around a little bed on Charlotte Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee at a hospice facility. And we told her earthly goodbye for the last time. And we held her hand and we loved on her as she took her last breath. I really, I really didn't know at that point I didn't know what to do. That was on Saturday night. We buried her on Tuesday. I didn't know what to do. I was driving on 411 Highway going to the cemetery as I did every day for the first year and a half that she was gone. And as I turned off the highway, I, my phone rang. And at that time, seems to work better out there now, if you're wondering. But at that time, phone service broke up right before you got to the cemetery. 
But I looked at my phone and I saw that it was Dwight Thompson, the great man of God, the general in the army of God. And I immediately pulled my little Dodge truck over to the side because I would not dishonor him by not taking his call if I was at all able. And he said, Pastor Jackie? And I said, hey, Dwight. And he said, man, I'm so sorry. I said, me too. I backed my my Dodge up beside of the railroad tracks right there on that, high, on that road going out to the cemetery. And we talked for probably an hour. But he said something to me. He said, in the book of Psalms, when the people had been at war and they were all defeated, the enemy jumped up and he said to them, Hang your harps on the tree. You're defeated. He said, Brother Jackie, he said, don't let your wife die in vain. He said, you guys started a work. He said, and I've been in that pulpit. He said, it is a, it is a sacred place. He said, get your harp off the willow tree and keep going. And that was the message that I preached that following Sunday morning. And ever since that day, I've tried my best to keep my heart off the willow tree and keep it tuned to the very values of God and the very instructions of God. This is the part that I said, God, I don't want to do that. But I'm not going to stop what he wants to do. For those of you that don't know this, I'm about to say this publicly so that there will be no room in the future for you to find out anything about me. And go, oh, there's the secret. No, I'm just going out the secret in case you don't know this. I made a huge mistake, a very embarrassing mistake, a devastating mistake, is I married the wrong woman. And of course, it ended in divorce. The reason I believe the Lord wants me to say that is because that got put on the internet this past couple weeks ago. Someone was looking for a church and Kenan put it on there. Come to High Praises Church. Everybody's welcome at High Praises Church. And someone that wants to remain faceless if I can just be honest with you because he's spineless Okay, Flesh, come back under. <laughs> he put some pretty nasty, ugly stuff on there. But you know what? He couldn't put it if I didn't do it. I've asked God and I've asked this church to forgive me. And I can't walk under condemnation from that church. Not because I'm arrogant. I promise you, it's not because I'm arrogant about it. I truly regret my actions. But I am forgiven. Uh, I stopped don't tell me that on my birthday Leticia <laughs> wait till tomorrow and then say it but not on my birthday
I love you. I love you. I love you. But I literally, at that moment, I told lots of people, and I told myself I would never be married again. But then I got healed. And when the Lord healed me, he healed my whole heart. <laughs> and right among our people, I had never had these thoughts about Heather before. I've been her pastor now 18 plus years. LaDonna was her mentor. Spent time with her, prayed with her, spoke over her. But then that revelation came and I prayed about it and I sought God about it. And to be honest with you, it wasn't a long time, but it was something that I knew that was right. And today, in two and a half weeks, we'll celebrate a year's marriage. And today, I'm here to tell you, I know her better than obviously I ne ever knew her before. And she's more of a woman of God than I ever thought of her to be. And my regards for her were very high before just as a person and a member of our church. But this is the part of the story that I'm doing for me today. That God said, if you want total freedom, you got to do this. Is when we started dating... I'm just going to be honest with you. I'd never heard anybody say anything bad about Heather. I'd never heard anybody say anything derogatory about Heather. I knew all of her past. I'll go ahead and get this out too in case anybody wants to spread it. I officiated her first wedding. So when we decided to get married, I, I said, hey, this is the second wedding I've been in for you. <laughs> but I'll say this, on our first wedding, I tried as a pastor as hard as I could to help them make their marriage work. And I wished it would have worked. I really do because I just, I don't believe that divorce is God's plan. But as Leticia has pointed out, we're not perfect. <laughs> but something happened a few weeks into our making an announcement people started leaving the church and people started unfriending me on Facebook and people started not speaking to her and people started going the other direction at church and I'm just going to be honest with you it made me mad and it wasn't a holy anger it was a selfish anger. And the reason it made me mad is because it hurt my feelings, y'all. It, it, just, it just did. It just hurt my feelings. But feelings were not given to us to follow. Feelings were given to us as indicators of a situation. And what causes us to get sideways in our life spiritually and as a kingdom Christian is when we 
stop allowing the word of God to lead us and we start being led by our feelings and our emotions. And I want to say to anyone and everyone, not that most of you all or hardly any, to be honest, has anything said anything directly to me because of the feelings that I took. And I'm saying this to the camera in case anyone that has left this church has sees this. And I promise you I'm not doing this as a charade or a show. I'm doing this for unity in the kingdom. I apologize for getting upset with you. I apologize for getting mad at you. And I apologize for my feelings towards you. I don't have to apologize for words that I've said because I didn't say anything. And if anyone's heard that I've said anything, it's a lie. For anybody that's sitting in this room today that that has, that have thought that I've did anything to dishonor my wife, LaDonna. I apologize for that. And I forgive you of the feelings for, for, for your feelings and I ask you to forgive me for mine. For any of you that have said anything, had any feelings or wanted to leave the church because of Heather in my relationship. And by the way, I ask her permission to be able to do this today because I honor her as my wife today. And I honor her as a woman of God. But I ask you to forgive me of any feelings that I may have had or actions that those feelings may have spurred me to walk in. Because as kingdoms, as kingdom Christians, and as we live as citizens of the kingdom of God, May we continually seek to first and foremost honor God, embody His values, serve others, and maintain unity in the body of Christ. Because I'm here to decree and declare to you, I feel an uprising in the kingdom of God, and I feel a unity beginning to take root again at High Praises Church. There was a moment that a man named Samson had been deceived by a woman named Delilah. And because he made a mistake, all of his power and all of his strength were taken away from him. But as he spent time in the prison of his actions or the prison that resulted in it that was a result of his actions as he began to seek God and get his heart right with God again he began to feel certain things growing out they shaved off his Nazarite vow of his hair they shaved that off but he started feeling it grow back and he knew what the Lord had said. I have felt the unity of God to begin to grow back at High Praises Church because High Praises Church was built on the fact that we love people no matter what. You know what, if you got mad at me, I apologize for any actions that may have caused that, but I will not be hard at you and I won't allow your hardness to stop me from loving you. I promise you that we're gonna reach across the aisle, we're gonna reach across the differences, we're gonna reach across all of the, uh, the adversarial things that Satan has raised up in our hearts and we're gonna see unity because I believe there's one thing this world needs. It needs the unconditional love that high praise this church was built on and I decree and declare just like Samson felt the the hair growing back and he pushed down and he did more after he had failed than he did before.
before he fell. I decree and declare that High Praises Church has been hit. High Praises Church has been attacked. High Praises High Praises Church has been brought down to our knees, but I believe just like we've spent 21 days of prayer, I believe that I feel the unity growing back, and we're gonna stand like we've never stood before, and we're gonna see people come to Jesus. If we will do this, We will be a shining light in a dark world pointing others to the transformative power of the kingdom of God. That was such a good word. And we really do hope that it made your life better. Why don't you share it with a friend so it can encourage them too? Yes, and living a life with Jesus is so easy. The Bible says all you do is say with your mouth that you believe that Jesus is your Savior. You believe that in your heart and you shall be saved. So I encourage you, say this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I believe you are my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's that easy, and welcome to the family. Now we want to connect with you on our socials, and on our website, you'll find more ways that you can partner with us. Thank you for joining us. And now, go out and dream big. Because we serve a a big big God. God.